Now be honest. As you go through your day, are you worried more about what other people think about you or what God thinks? For most of us, it's probably more often about people. Let's let God's truth turn things right side up. Here's Pastor Dave. When I was in high school, a long time ago, really long time ago now, uh, I was very concerned with my reputation and making sure that I didn't do anything to embarrass myself. I was not always successful at that, but it was important to me to be accepted by other people. When I was a, a junior in high school, I was really into football, and I was, I was playing really well heading into that season, and it was about a week before our first game of the season, we were going to play Evergreen High School, and we were ready, to, we were, we were going to go play these guys, and my dad uh, shows up, or starts showing up to football practices, and, and he would stand with the coaches on the sidelines, not in the bleachers, where maybe some of the other parents that came to practice might sit, but on the sidelines, and loudly cheer on the team, and unlike myself, he can be very loud. As you know, I'm a pretty reserved guy and <laughs> quiet. Uh, no, we have the same, the same problem there as far as loudness. And, and, you know, he'd cheer on the team, not always uh, getting the names of the players right. Sometimes he would call one guy, another guy's name and things like that. And, you know, whatever. That's Pastor Dave. He's just trying to do his thing. It was actually very loving that my dad wanted to support me because there are a lot of children who don't have their fathers around. Big problem that we have is a lot of children don't have their fathers around, or they do have their parents around, but their parents are so uh, focused and busy on other things that they don't support their children. And so it was really a blessing that he supported me. But for me, someone who was overly concerned about looking cool, and someone who's over -concerned, overly concerned about not doing anything out of the ordinary, this was embarrassing. It was embarrassing to me. Um, and so, you know, it was embarrassing to me. And I went to my mom. And I told her that I was embarrassed by my dad coming to practices. And, and my mom, who is, you know, very trustworthy, and, and you can tell her things and, and expect her to keep a secret, went directly to my dad and <laughs> snitched me out, right? And it really, I probably wanted her to tell him, to be honest with you. But it really hurt his feelings. It really hurt his feelings. Uh, you know, his, his, he was doing this out of a heart for love for me and support for me. It's something that he wanted to do to show that he loved me and supported me. So to find out that I was embarrassed, and I wasn't really embarrassed by him. I was embarrassed by anything that was out of the ordinary at the time because I was so concerned with how I looked to other people. Um, but it hurt his feelings so much, and he was so concerned about him and not embarrassing me that that first game of the year, he didn't come because he didn't want to embarrass me. He didn't want to, you know, do that thing. And that was, I mean, it was my first time starting both ways, offense and defense on varsity. It was a big deal for me. It was, you know, it was his first game of the season. It was, I had a great game. And as I looked to the stands, every time I could see that my mom was there and my dad wasn't. And I was really sad. I was really sad that my dad didn't show up, wasn't able to show up for that game because I had told him that he was an embarrassment to me. My need to impress other people had ended up hurting both my father and me. And here's the thing. You know how many guys that I played football with I'm still hanging out with to this day? Very few. Very few. Almost none of them. And either way, I'm pretty sure that they didn't care whether my dad came to practice. They weren't thinking about that. Certainly, they weren't thinking about it then, and they certainly aren't thinking about it now. And even if they did care, what difference does a high school boy's opinion matter? But even if they thought I was a total embarrassment, like, oh, gosh, look at David. He's such a dork, whatever. Even if they thought that, the fact is they would think it for about 30 seconds to a minute, and then they would go back to thinking about the one thing that they think about all the time, themselves themselves, right? Because that's what people think about. We think about ourselves. The fact was that I was worried about how I looked in front of a few high school guys, and I did not think about how my obsession with my own desire for approval would affect my own father. My father was there when I was born. He was there all my life, and is still there, still here. He's actually here today. Those guys were a very small part of my life for a very short time. But we can all fall to what the scripture calls the fear of man. The fear of man. Proverbs 29, 25 says this. The fear of man brings a snare, but whoever trusts in the Lord shall be safe. Why did I care more about how some people in my social circle felt about me than how my father felt about me? Why did I care more about that? I think it was probably in retrospect as I look back, it was probably because I knew that my father's love was unconditional 
so I could kind of treat my father poorly and he was still going to love me. And meanwhile, maybe I'd get the approval of all these other people as well. What a jerk I was, right? But that's what fear will do to you. That's what fear will do to you. It'll make you presume upon or harm others so that you can get something that you want for yourself. What is that, the, the heart of the fear of man? Well, fear. Fear, probably pride too, but fear and fear is usually based on a lie. It's usually based on a lie. And here's the problem with fear of man. It gives other people the ability to harm you in ways that you should not be allowing them to harm you and in ways that they shouldn't be able to harm you if you're truly a Christ follower plugged into him. We've been in a, in a series called Right Side Up, a series about the Sermon on the Mount uh, that Jesus Christ taught. And it's, we find it in Matthew chapters 5 through 7. We finished chapter 5 last week. We're getting into chapter 6 this week. We've been studying how Jesus Christ has taught us to live, how he's commanded us to live. We've been studying the kingdom life. We've seen how the world and the culture of the world is upside down and how Jesus is showing us what it looks like to follow his commands and live right side up, to live right side up. And so uh, let's get into the scripture for today. We're going to be in chapter 6 of Matthew. If you have your Bibles, you can grab them now. We're going to study verses 1 through 6 and 16 through 21. I'm actually going to skip verses 7 through 15. And Lord willing, we're going to get into that in the next message in this series. Um, because I would love to hit those verses, but it would take a really long time to get through them all. And I need to keep my sermon under an hour so that you all have plenty of time to get home in time to watch your four-hour football game. <laughs> I'm just saying, okay? All right, let's read the scripture passage for today. Take heed that you do not do your charitable deeds before men to be seen by them. Otherwise, you have no reward from your Father in heaven. Therefore, when you do a charitable deed, do not sound a trumpet before you, as the hypocrites do in the synagogue and in the streets, that they might have glory from men. Assuredly, I say to you, they have their reward. But when you do a charitable deed, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing that your charitable deed may be in secret, and your Father who sees in secret will himself reward you openly. And when you pray, you shall not be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the corners of the streets, that they may be seen by men. Assuredly, I say to you, they have their reward, but you, when you pray, go into your room, and when you have shut your door, pray to your Father who is in the secret place, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you openly. Moreover, when you fast, do not be like the hypocrites with a sad countenance, for they disfigure their faces that they may appear to men to be fasting. Assuredly, I say to you, they have their reward. But you, when you fast, anoint your head and wash your face so that you do not appear to men to be fasting, but to your Father who is in the secret place, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you openly. Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust destroys, and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. The first thing that I want to concentrate on in our study here is two words. They come up several times in this passage. They're, these are the words. When you. When you give. When you pray. When you fast. The implication is that for a Christ follower... Giving, praying, and fasting are obvious and normal acts of righteousness in your life. Obvious and normal facts of righteousness in your life. They're not recommended, they're commanded. When you pray, when you fast, when you give. As Christ followers, among other things, we give, we fast, and we pray as part of the rhythms of our lives. Now, for some of us, including myself, for some of us, uh, they're not necessarily always a part of the rhythms of our life. And that's something I want us to think about, is that these are commands, a part of our life. As you're thinking about the rest of what we do as we dive into this, I want you to keep that in mind. One note I will make is that some people have physical conditions that make them unable to fast, unable to fast. Um, it's unhealthy for them. So if that's you, you need to go talk to your doctor. If you think that's you, that's fine. But by the way, the physical conditions I'm talking about are not that when you don't eat, you get really, really hungry. That's not the physical condition I'm talking about. That's kind of the point of fasting. So that's not, that's not going to work. Um, but we're talking about righteousness here. We're talking about things that are part and parcel of the righteous life. 
part and parcel of the righteous life. If you remember, remember our study from last week, the last verse we studied was this, Matthew 5, 48. Therefore, you shall be perfect, just as your Father in heaven is perfect. Jesus is calling us to full righteousness, to be fully righteous, to full holiness. We're supposed to be fully holy, perfect, perfect. Now, what's the temptation that we're going to struggle with when the Holy Spirit works in us and we start to become more and more righteous and we move, forgetting what is behind, we're moving towards, we're moving towards perfection. What's the thing that's going to come and, and trip us up? Pride, the desire to have other people see our righteousness and give us praise for it. That's what he's, that's what he's handling here. We start to feel superior. We start to parade our righteousness around in front of others so they can see just how righteous we are. That's going to be the temptation. If you guys have been around very many people who have quit smoking, they were a smoker and they quit smoking, you may have noticed that some people, when that happens, once they stop smoking themselves, they start really looking down on other people who smoke. They're like, I can't believe you're still smoking. It's such a bad and horrible habit. It's so unhealthy and whatever. The other person's thinking, dude, you were going two packs of menthols a day like three weeks ago, right? Right? And here you are, you're judging me for smoking. But that's what happens. You get a little righteousness. And with that comes a little pride, a little I'm a better than somebody else. And a little bit of look at me. I want to be noticed for what I've done. And in that that case of those folks, they want to do it by pushing other folks down. Look, that's the temptation. Look at my righteousness. Aren't I a good boy? Aren't I a good boy? We follow the commands of Jesus Christ, not for those reasons. We follow the commands of Jesus Christ because we follow Jesus Christ. We follow the commands of Jesus Christ because we love him, because we love God. That's why we do it. We do not follow his commands so we can get approval from other people. We follow Jesus' commands because we love him and we want to please him. And we're told clearly in scripture here that when we are charitable and giving or when we pray or when we fast so that we can be seen by other people, to get glory from other people, that glory that we get from other people is our reward. The approval of other people, that's your reward. And what a reward it is, right? How many compliments do you need to thrive? How many uh, Facebook likes do you need to thrive? How much, how long does that Facebook like or that compliment or that whatever keep you going? Fill your self-worth tank. Not long. Not long, not a good way to get yourself value and your self-worth. Jesus didn't seek the approval of the crowds. Why do you think he didn't seek the approval of the crowds? I mean, they, they loved him, right? Because he knew their hearts. He knew it was in the heart of men and women. How many one-hit wonder bands have there been that the, the people who are in those bands are now working at a hardware shop in nowhere town, West Virginia? Or if they're lucky, they're playing 80s night at the bowling alley right? Nothing wrong with 80s night at the bowling alley. Sorry if I've offended anyone. Or anyone who was in a one-hit wonder band, I'm cool with you too. It's all good. (laughs) What happened to all the loving crowds that used to show up? And oh, they're so great, paying 100 bucks a ticket and, and, and wanted to hear them play and they were all there. What happened to all those people? Well, they moved on, right? They moved on because the praise and admiration of people cannot be trusted to bring peace or comfort to your heart. It can't. Only Jesus can give you that. The love and affection of your Father in heaven is eternal, unconditional, and powerful. The love and affection of people cannot be trusted. So Jesus makes it clear. Stop showing off. Stop showing off for people with your righteousness. Righteousness is not about the approval of people. It's about your relationship with God. That's what it's about. So let's flesh these out, these three things out that he talks about. First, giving. Some people like to make a big deal when they give. They just do. Uh, They give to the church or they give to charity or they give to a person in need and, and and they want to make a big deal about it. So they talk about it. And then after that, they talk about it. And then later, they talk about it some more. They just make a really big deal. They want the praise of people. They want other people to start talking about, did you hear that so-and-so gave this big gift? And so that's what they're thriving on. They want everyone to know just how swell they are. They want to make sure they're getting the maximum impact in personal praise for their money. And that's all they will get. That's all they will get 
is the praise of people because they have shown that their heart was not righteous. They were not giving because of their love for God and their love for other people. They were giving to honor themselves and get quick praise from others. And that's their reward, the quick praise they got from others. They're a one-hit wonder giver. That's where they're at. Jesus says this, that we read, Do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, that your charitable deed may be in secret, and your Father who sees in secret will himself reward you openly. Now that's pretty private. Don't even let your left hand know what your right hand is doing. My left hand is nosy, right? It's going to know what's going on with my right hand. I mean, not really. My hands aren't people. But, and he's not talking about literally not letting your left hand know what your right hand is doing. He's saying that it should be so secret that it should almost be a secret even to yourself. That's how secret it should be. If you're making a big show of your giving, you're simply not giving primarily out of a love for God. You're really giving primarily out of love for yourself. Don't look for public praise from giving. Give from the heart because you love God and let your righteousness between you and your Father in heaven be your reward. One of the things I, I really love about this local expression of the body of Christ here at Acts Church is that I, I don't see a lot of selfish giving. I don't see a lot of selfish giving. There are people who have given large gifts financially to Christ's church and to missions and to other ministries, and no one knows about it. I'm actually going to read their names here so they won't get any rewards from heaven. <laughs> I'm kidding. I'm kidding. The fact is, I don't know what you all give. I don't know what you all give. And no one at Acts Church in my four years of pastoring here has ever tried to gain favor with me or influence in how the church goes or whatever by telling me what they give. It's never happened here. No one's ever said, well, I'd really like the carpet to be green, and I do give blah, blah, blah. No one's done that. Not one time ever. And that's amazing. And I want to thank you all for being good givers and having good heart attitudes about your giving. That shows a maturity and a love for Jesus that's real. And just so you know, if you did come to me to try to gain favor or, or influence because you gave a lot, it wouldn't happen. Because that's between you and God. It's not my thing. And giving isn't about getting favor with the church or favor with other people or favor with me or whatever. It's about you and Jesus. It's about an outpouring of your love for Jesus and for other people. It's about seeing the gospel be spread. That's what it's about. And so I thank you for being the way that you have been. And you should give generously and sacrificially so that we as a church can be used by Christ as his body to bring the good news of life and peace with God through Jesus. That's what we do it for, not for any other reason. You should not give for the praise of people because you have a fear of man and you need people to think that you're great. And let me just help you out. If you struggle with that, with a fear of man, I want to help you out right now. You ready? I love you. The people in this church, they love you. And guess what? It's not because you volunteer a lot. It's not because you give a lot of money. It's not because your prayers are the best or your fasting is just lit. Okay? We love you because God loves you and made you in his image and likeness. And there is nothing that you can do to lessen that love or to increase it. It is without measure. It is unconditional because it comes from God. Knowing that... You do not need to fear men. God loves you, and he uses his church to love you. I'm not saying nobody ever fails at that. I'm just saying Jesus' love for you is without measure, unconditional, powerful. You have no need to fear other people, to need their affection, to need their love, to wake up in the morning and go, I hope I get built up today, or I'm going to be depressed tonight when I go to bed. That doesn't need to be you because you're in Christ. And I love you, and these people love you because Jesus loves you. So when you come to church, show up for Jesus. Not so that you can check something off the box, or at least these people saw that I was in church, or at least they're not going to call me because I missed for a couple weeks, which we do. But not because we're, we're counting your righteousness, because we love you. We want you to be here with us, so show up for Jesus' sake. Pray to your Father in heaven for his sake. Fast for his sake. For devotion to him, don't worry about our opinion or anyone else's opinion. Worry about your relationship with Jesus. Money is such a big issue for us, isn't it? 
And it's so easy to want to make a big splash when we give some away. I hope that today's episode has helped us all get a new perspective on how God wants us to give. As always, if you have any questions or comments about today's lesson, please call us at 360-885-9000 or use email info at axchurchnw.org. Next time, Pastor David will teach us about prayer and fasting, and I hope you'll join us here on Contemplate. Contemplate.